All right, guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's start this lecture with a multiple choice question. So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, guys, the correct answer here is B, two months. So cyclothymia, this is, of course, a milder form of bipolar disorder, and it tends to fluctuate between mild, mild depressive symptoms and hypomanic symptoms. Now, remember, these findings need to be there for at least two years or more. The symptoms need to be present at least half of the time, and any period of remission cannot last longer than two months. If it does, it wipes out this diagnosis. That kills the support for this diagnosis. So that's a very important and often overlooked feature of cyclothymia that I think a lot of students miss, which is why I created the question based on that. <clears throat> now, while we're on this topic, let's take a look at bipolar disorder. So first, let's define what a manic versus a hypomanic episode is and looks like. A manic episode, think of this as a distinct period where the patient has persistently elevated moods, activity levels, energy levels, and that has to last at least one week. Now, we can use the mnemonic dig fast to remember the main findings of the episode. And when it comes to dig fast, the mnemonic, we want to see at least three of these findings along with functional impairment or hospitalization in order to support and then make a diagnosis. So dig fast represents the following. Distractibility, impulsivity or indiscretion, grandiosity, flight of ideas, increased goal-oriented activity and psychomotor agitation, decreased need for sleep, and talkativeness. Now, a hypomanic episode, on the other hand, while similar to a manic episode, isn't severe enough to really impair the patient functionally or socially. Now, as opposed to that manic episode, which I said lasts how long? One week. The hypomanic episode is diagnosed when present for at least four consecutive days. All right, now don't forget that information. I want you to be able to look at a vignette and say, sounds manic, sounds hypomanic. That's really important. Now let's take a look at bipolar types one and two. So very simple, bipolar type one is a condition characterized by one or more manic episodes with or without a hypomanic or depressive episode that may be separated by any length of time. Bipolar two is characterized by a hypomanic and depressive episode without a history of manic episodes. And we should treat bipolar disorder with mood stabilizing agents, such as what? Such as lithium, such as valproic acid, we also have lamotrigine, carbamazepine. As well, we can use any of the atypical antipsychotics if needed. Now, before we move on, what is the big concern with lithium? I want you guys to think about this. We're going to talk about lithium a couple more times, but the big concern with lithium, and don't forget this, is has a very narrow therapeutic window. What that means is that we always have to be watching our patient's serum levels of lithium when we use it. Otherwise, adverse effects can and will happen. So keep that in mind, please. Lithium has a very narrow window of uh, safety. Narrow safety margin, narrow uh, safety window. All right, either way, uh, synonymous. Just remember, you don't have a lot of room for error when it comes to lithium. All right, let's move on to our next question. This is multiple choice. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is D, persistent depressive disorder. So persistent depressive disorder is characterized by symptoms of major depressive disorder that are milder and they last at least two years. Now the diagnosis requires that at least two of the main symptoms of depression are present and that remissions do not last longer than what? Two months at any one time. So just as a side note here, if you see this in a child, it's not a two year period, it's only one year. Now let's take a look at the rest of the depressive disorders that we really do need to know for our exam. Let's start with major depressive disorder. So this is of course characterized by a severe episode of depression that lasts at least two weeks and that is characterized by at least five of the main diagnostic symptoms. Now this is of course on top of a depressed mood or on top of anhedonia. So you want to see five of nine plus depressed mood and or anhedonia. So we can easily remember what those nine diagnostic symptoms are with the Sigi caps mnemonic, which you probably have read a million times, but I'm going to give it to you real quick. Don't forget this. These are your nine. Uh, these are seven of the findings. 
And we also have, of course, uh, depression, uh, depressed mood and or anhedonia as the nine. So five out of the nine, two need to be at least the two that I just mentioned. So SIGICAP stands for sleep disturbances, interest lost, guilty feelings, energy decrease, concentration decrease, appetite, appetite or weight changes, psychomotor retardation or agitation, as well as suicidal ideation. Now, don't forget, we always need to rule out the presence of a history of a manic episode in order to properly diagnose them with major depression, because if there is a history of mania, that changes things quite a bit. Now, when it comes to MDD, major depressive disorder, what is the first line medication that we're going to use? What category of drugs? SSRIs. But don't forget, especially when it comes to your exam, cognitive behavioral therapy is also very important and it's a useful tool in conjunction with medications when it comes to treating MDD. Now, let's take a look at the most common subtype of depression in adults, which is, made, which is depression with atypical features. Okay, so this one's very interesting. And as I said, this is very common. So you'll see this a lot. Now, this is a unique form of depression because patients have the characteristic symptoms of depression, but if they're given good news or something positive happens in their life, they actually sort of temporarily improve and feel real good. Now it's temporary, right? It, it comes and then you know they fall back into it, but you won't see that in regular major depression. So just as though with MDD, okay, this can be effectively managed with cognitive behavioral therapy and with SSRIs. But it's really important that you recognize that unique differentiator with uh, depression with atypical features. Very interesting stuff. Next, we have MDD with seasonal pattern, right? We used to call this seasonal affective disorder. This one's really easy to recognize due to the fact that it shows up seasonally. Now, what is the most common season that you would expect this to show up? Obviously, when the weather sucks, the winter months. So don't forget though, this can't just happen once. You need to see this in two or more consecutive years in order to support a diagnosis. So if you have a patient who comes in on uh, January 10th, and they have the signs and symptoms of depression, but this is the first time, do not diagnose them or do not pick in a vignette uh, MDD with seasonal pattern because it's not correct because we haven't met the time frame criteria, which as I said, is two years in a row. That's a huge mistake students make. And you know, interestingly, a lot of students think they know psych very well, and then they take their NBMEs, their, their school's comp or the step, and they don't do as well as they think they did. And oftentimes it's because students get sort of caught up in recognizing one thing but overlooking the small details which make all the difference such as right here so please guys don't make a simple mistake psych should be you should be getting 90 95 in psych which should pull your score up okay the last thing we're going to look out look at here is mdd with psychotic features and this is a condition that combines major depressive disorder with either hallucinations or delusions now the features of psychosis in this condition should only occur while the patient is experiencing that major depressive episode. Otherwise, it is not a diagnosis of MDD with psychotic features. It would be something completely different. We'll talk about that shortly. Now, this condition is where standard MDD treatment uh, strays a bit from convention because we're gonna use an antidepressant here in conjunction with an atypical antipsychotic. And that's one of, you know, for the sake of our exam, that's probably one of the only times we're going to combine an antidepressant and an antipsychotic. You're not going to see that a lot um, in this lecture because it's just not something that is done a lot. So if you ever see that combination, you want to be thinking of MDD with psychotic features. Otherwise, don't make that connection with an antidepressant and an antipsychotic. You'll probably get the, the question incorrect. And obviously, that's the last thing we want. All right, let us move on. We're gonna do a matching exercise here. This one's fairly straightforward. This is matching peripartum mood disturbances with their correct features. So I want you guys to hit that pause button, figure this one out, come on back when you think you've got, you've got everything correct, and we will discuss the uh, peripartum mood disturbances. All right, guys, so hopefully you got those correct. If you didn't, go ahead and fix them. But let's look at the peripartum mood disorders, which don't forget, 
If your patient has a history of mood disorders, that's going to significantly increase the risk that they experience a peripartum mood disorder. So always keep that in mind. Now, first is the most common problem we're going to see, which is the postpartum blues. This has an incidence rate of 50 to 85% and is a condition where you will see a depressed affect, sadness, tearfulness, and fatigue. And this typically begins within two to three days after delivering the baby. Now, this doesn't necessarily need medication. It doesn't need anything because it usually resolves on its own within two weeks. But one key thing you want to keep in mind, and if on your exam they say, what should you do after, um, after the patient's two-week window has, let's say, gone by and they're feeling better, you need to monitor them because over the next few months, you want to make sure they don't actually develop major depressive disorder with peripartum onset, which is the second one we're going to talk about here. And that's, of course, going to warrant medication. So let's talk about that. So MDD with peripartum onset, as opposed to the, the postpartum blues, this is seen in around 10 to 15% of patients. And this is a condition that I want you to think of as basically major depressive disorder because it meets the criteria for MDD. That means we're going to treat it with cognitive behavioral therapy and an SSRI. Now the most concerning postpartum mood disturbance that you absolutely positively need to always be looking out for is what we call postpartum psychosis. Now this only has an incidence rate of 0.1 to 0.2%, meaning it is rare, but nonetheless, it is worrisome. So what is this characterized by? Well, it's characterized by psychotic features like delusions, like hallucinations. You also will see thoughts of harming the baby and that ultimately is the biggest concern. We wanna make sure that, that the baby is safe. Now, one of the main risk factors for this, in addition to, as I mentioned previously, a history of mood disorder, is if it is the first child born. So, you know, sometimes in a vignette, we will overlook things like, you know, G1, P1, or, or G2, P2, you always want to know, is this the first time? Because if it is, it's brand new to the patient. And you always want to consider, hey, something um, that we might not have seen before might show up this time because it's the first time we are experiencing this. So I want you to keep that in mind. In a vignette, if you think postpartum psychosis is a possibility, I want you to go back to the very first couple of words and say, hey, is this the uh, mother's first child? If it is, just remember, that increases the risk. Now, if it's her third or fourth, that doesn't mean that it's not possible. It just means that it's not as likely because we probably would have seen it earlier if it was a high uh, likelihood of happening. But just, you know, these are just little tips to keep in mind. Because there's a significant risk in this condition to both the mom and the baby, you typically need to hospitalize them and the treatment modality of choice here is going to be with atypical antipsychotics. Now, just as a side note, if medication doesn't help, we can consider ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, because it is fast and it is very effective against this. Now, it's also uh, effective if the patient's demonstrating uh, acute suicidality, not just in this condition, but otherwise, uh, for cases of refractory depression, for catatonia, as well as depression with psychotic symptoms. So just remember that if you get a vignette and mom is not responding to, th to, to medication, ECT is a possible uh, option. How does ECT work? It induces a tonic-clonic seizure under anesthesia. And although it does have some adverse effects like headache, partial memory loss, these do resolve uh, usually within six months time. Now, while you might think, hey, ECT, this cannot be safe for the baby. Uh, it is actually safe in pregnancy. It's safe for the mom. It's safe for the baby. Um, and even in the elderly population, if they have, you know, um, depression or any of these symptoms that I mentioned that simply are not being managed with medication, ECT doesn't have any absolute contraindications. So it's absolutely positively fair to choose this if you get a vignette uh, that says, you know, it's the case is refractory and nothing seems to help. All right. Let's move on. Let's do uh, some true false. Um, as always, I'm going to stick with you during the true false. And what we're going to do here is talk about suicide risk factors. Before we start, I want to remind you of the mnemonic we use to remember the risk factors for suicide. That mnemonic is sad persons. And sad persons stands for the following. S is for sex. And typically males are more likely to commit suicide. Remember, females attempt more often, but males are more likely to actually complete the task. Age, completion rate is higher in younger and in older individuals. Depression, if they're depressed, that's a risk factor. 
Previous attempts, this is in fact your number one risk factor. There might be a question a little bit later that tests you on this, so hopefully you were listening. Ethanol or drug use. These will increase the risk that, that uh, suicide attempts will be made, of course. A rational thinking loss, this typically just means psychosis. Um, sickness, a medical illness. Someone who's got a chronic medical illness and has a lot of pain, poor uh, quality of life, that's gonna increase the risk that they try to commit suicide as well. Um, an organized plan is uh, the next uh, thing in line here. No spouse or social support, and then stated future intent, okay? So that was your sad person's mnemonic. Now. Let's dive in, and it's really important that you, you, you pay attention here and make sure you know this stuff. Suicide is oftentimes something that students sort of gloss over, but you really want to make sure you know these high-yield nuggets because this could pop up on exam day. So let's dive in. First question, true or false? What do you guys think? This is absolutely true. Not only does access to firearms increase the risk of suicide completion, they are the most common method of suicide attempt and completion in the United States. More guns, more access to guns, that's probably why you see guns being the most common cause of suicide attempts and completions. All right, next question, true or false? Of course, this is true. Women try more often, men complete more often. Why does this happen? More often than not, women will use things like pills and uh, men will use things like firearms just makes sense that if you're using firearms, chances are you're gonna have a higher rate of success. Next question, true or false? What do you guys think? True or false? This is actually true. The risk factors that increase the risk of suicide attempt, remember, sad persons is suicide uh, success. But suicide attempt is family history for suicide, as well as recent hospitalizations for psychiatric illness. Okay, don't forget, these are risk factors for attempt. Sad persons is for completion. Just don't make that mistake, okay? Next question, true or false? What do you think? True or false? This one's false, I told you. You should have remembered uh, from the mnemonic a couple minutes ago, the number one risk factor for completion of suicide is a previous attempt. All right, we got one more here and then we will break true or false you guys think? Of course, this is true. Remember, this is part of the sad person's mnemonic. And so you should have just always run through that mnemonic. Now, before we move on to the next topic, let's look at some of the protective factors against suicide, which is extremely important to keep in mind. So some of the protective factors against suicide are effective care for comorbidities. So if you have an illness, but you've got really good care, that is going to be protective. If you've got community connectedness, do you, have, do you have family who's local? Do you have friends? Do you have a spouse? Do you have a friend? Anything. Support system will lower your risk. It's actually going to be protective. Loneliness, isolation is the worst thing for someone's mental health. And so obviously that just goes without saying that if you lack it, it's going to be a risk factor. If you've got it, it's going to protect you. Culture and or religious beliefs, specifically when they encourage self-preservation, that is protective. And the last thing is strong problem-solving skills. Now, I didn't dig into why that was the case, but in my mind, if you've got, let's say, problems in your life and you don't really know how to cope with many things in life, you might try and take the, the wrong way out. Whereas if you can sit down and say, okay, this is what's going on, let me try and figure this out, let me do some research, that's gonna give you you know, something to strive for. And in my mind, uh, that would definitely protect you uh, against wanting to commit suicide and being successful in doing so, okay? Uh, obviously, I'm just speculating, uh, but I find this stuff very fascinating because, you know, uh, this is, this, especially over the last couple of years, this has, you know, just been skyrocketing here in the U.S. And, um, you know, it's good to know how we can protect our patients, and it's really good to know how we can keep an eye out for our patients to recognize anything that might be uh, something that might, you know, push them in the wrong direction. So keep that in mind, guys. All right, let's take a break, and I will see you guys on the next lecture. <laughs>